In this episode, I talk about why I'm talking so much about expensive pens lately, how I balance out products and people as my business grows, and what are some of the worst pens that I've ever owned. Well, hello there. I am Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 125 here in early June of 2016. What's that? Did I... Oh. Oh. Can't believe it. I got poo on my shirt. Jeez. I'm just kidding. I bought the shirt specifically for Q&A, and then I re immediately regretted it. I was like, am I really gonna wear the pile of poo emoji shirt on Q&A. And then I wore it in here to work last week and everybody was like, oh my gosh, you have to wear that shirt. And I was like, yeah, you're right, I do. So anyway, this is the pile of poo emoji. And I literally don't even know what it means. I even tried to research it. I was like, I don't know if it's like, I'm, you know, in the thick of it, but I'm happy about it or whatever. I don't know. So I'd love your interpretation on that. That's not the question of the week, but go ahead and throw your thoughts in on the comments there as to what you think this emoji means. I just thought it was funny and kind of snarky and quirky. So I, uh, I wore it anyway. I'll probably regret it later on in life, but as my kids are looking up to me and aware of things that are going on. But anyway, until I get to that point, um, it's been a pretty busy week this past week. Had a nice uh, family time this past weekend, celebrated Memorial Weekend, which, you know, I got a comment on YouTube last week. I won't call you out too much, but, um, you know, you called me out a little bit for not truly talking about what Memorial Day means. I kind of glossed over it. And, you know, every now and then, you know, it wasn't like a personal attack kind of comment, but it did, it did just kind of hit me. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I didn't really take time to kind of reflect and, and think about what that holiday actually meant. So I'm sorry about that. It's It's not reflective of kind of kind of who I truly am and I was just moving very fast. I recorded on Wednesday last week so the holiday yet wasn't quite on my mind. I didn't take the time to really think about it. So to all of our servicemen and women, uh, I just really appreciate what you do, what your families do, what you do for your families and you know the fact that you're doing uh, amazing things, fighting for our freedom and defending our country so that I can sit here and do things like this. I have a lot of uh, friends who are in the military. Um, I was in the Corps of Cadets at Virginia Tech. I almost, almost went into the Army. It was very, very close. You know, of course, almost doesn't count for much, but at the same time, I just really appreciate all that you do. So I'm sorry it's too little too late, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that I was in the wrong last week, so I'm sorry. Um, also, let's see here, had lots of personal stuff going on. It was a good weekend spending time with family, but had some personal drama that happened that I really can't share at this point. Um, just know that I got a lot personally that's happening. Sorry, I can't <laughs> indulge any more than that. I'm usually pretty open with my personal life, but um, this I can't really share yet. But anyway, um, have lots of business stuff going on as well. Um, can't elaborate a lot on that, but our company's still growing. You know, we're in the process of planning for future things, and uh, I'm just in a very strategic space right now. So I've been really light on the Snapchat. I haven't been posting very much on my own social media. Thankfully, got a rocking team here who's helping keep things moving along uh, from the business stand front, but I've just uh, personally been kind of MIA a little bit, even for my own team. I'm kind of like in a cave and all these meetings and stuff, so it's just kind of where I'm at right now. It's not gonna last forever, but um, last couple of weeks I've been, I've been pretty deep in it there. Uh, my team's been prepping for Filofax coming up in July. We're gonna be launching Filofax uh, planners. So pretty excited about that. Got lots of photography happening basically over the next month. It's a big product line. We're trying to learn these products as well as we can. Got some training coming from our Filofax rep here uh, next week. So that should be pretty good so we can learn it even better. Just a lot of stuff there. Um, we got a restocking of Dark Lilac ink, Lamy Dark Lilac ink. I think it's gonna be our last shipment. We may get some more, but it's not guaranteed. So as of the time this video goes out, I don't know if we'll have any left. We got it on Tuesday and I don't know if we're gonna have it all the way to Friday um, because there was a pretty high demand for it. So I'm sorry if you didn't get it. If you did, congrats. There's just not a ton of this ink available. Um, also restocked Delta Matte Black Unicas. It's been 
four months since we've had those in stock, so that's really cool to get them back in. These ones are not numbered like the original batch were, but other than that, are exactly the same. 76 bucks, not a bad pen for an Italian-made Delta matte black pen. It's very cool looking. Um, also announced the Visconti Watermark. It's a very high-end pen. I realize I've been talking a lot about high-end pens lately. I'll be addressing that in Q&A here coming up. Uh, but it's a really gorgeous pen. I've actually known about it for several months and haven't been able to talk about it yet. But I got to see a sample in person. It looks on freaking real. It's just really, really cool. I've never had a Sterling overlay pen before, so that's really kind of neat. Um, speaking of Sterling, got Pilot Sterling, which is, um, you know, we kind of picked these up when we uh, started doing Namiki, and uh, they're really kind of cool. They are um, Sterling Silver. They're hand engraved. Um, we have three different designs. There's actually, I think, nine different ones, but we opted for three. Very shiny pen, and then it has an inlaid gold nib which is pretty sweet as well. So 18 karat gold nib at that. So really gorgeous pen, I'm trying to get, to get fingerprints all over it, but it's just gonna happen. I got the dragon one for myself, it's kind of cool. So that's kind of neat to be having those. Um, and then uh, I do want to give you a heads up that Q&A is coming up over the next month through like June and just a little bit into July. Um, I'm gonna be out a little bit. Jenny's gonna be out a little bit, so we're gonna have some staggering as far as the recorded Q and A's go. We have three uh, Goulet guest videos that we shot in Atlanta back in April that Jenny's still working on editing that we are gonna publish intermittently with Q&A. So rather than publishing on top of a week, regular weekly Q&A because we're having so many absences and stuff, we're gonna keep publishing the Q&A time every week, but I'm gonna have three Q&As over the next five or six that uh, are gonna be Goulet guests instead of this normal Q&A. So just a heads up on that, I'm gonna have an interview with Anna Reinert, or sorry, Anna Reinert, excuse me, of uh, Well-Appointed Desk, I'm also gonna have Mike Hurley of Relay FM and the Pen Addict, and then I'm gonna have Jeff and Brad from Knock Pen Co. Or Knock Cases, Knock Co. Knock Co Pen Cases. Yes, sorry guys, can't even say your names right. But uh, I'm gonna have all those interviews coming out, as well as a few Q and A's kind of staggered in there, and then we'll get back into our routine once July rolls around. It's just kind of how it goes in the summertime. You guys know, because you're doing the same thing. Families and vacations and all that kind of good stuff. So let's get into the questions this week. Got some pen and writing questions. This is from maxung11 on Instagram. A lot of Instagram questions this week, as always. Uh, should I buy lots of inexpensive pens, gin hows and metros, etc., or a few expensive pens, M1000, Homo sapiens, etc.? Very short question, very sweet. This is actually not M1000, it's an M800. I don't have an M1000, but. Gin House, Metropolitans, you're talking about a $10 to $15 pen. M800, M1000, well, you asked M1000, Homo Sapiens, you're talking $700 to $1,000. Is it really worth it? I've answered questions like that before. Is a high expensive pen really worth it? Yada, yada, yada. The answer is yes and no. It depends on what you want, what you value. For most people, no, but for some people, yes. So if you're asking me, like, should I buy lots of inexpensive pens? So basically, I'm assuming, like, you have the same amount of money, you have a thousand bucks, should you be like one thousand dollar pen or should you buy a hundred ten dollar pens? That's all gonna depend on your personal preference. When I first started out in fountain pens, I focused on the inexpensive ones because for me it was all about the ink. The pen was just a vehicle to get the ink on the page. So I wanted, I didn't care about the pen body, I didn't care about weight, balance, material, none of that. I did care about the nib and you can get pens with decent nibs at a low price. But I didn't care about any other form factor. All it was was getting ink on the paper. And you can get ink on the paper for a really good price. You can get them, you know, pens like the Jinhao and the Metropolitan, Lamy Safari, you know, all pens in this price range, $50 and under for sure. You can get lots of good pens, good writing pens that'll last a long time and they will perform very admirably. You do not need to spend this kind of money on a pen. You just don't. I'm sorry, it's the case. You do it because you want to, but you don't need to, to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Now, that said, of course, there's lots of other things going on with these pens. And I would say, if you are just getting into the fountain pen hobby and you're like, I don't know, I would obviously steer you towards the less expensive stuff until you learn more and you get into it. There are some people who definitely ascribe to like, 
own fewer things, but better ones. Absolutely, I can very much see that. There's other people who are like, I don't need expensive things. I would rather have, you know, 12 pens that are all different colors, that have a different ink in each pen, all that kind of stuff. That's totally cool too. So I would say, look at other areas of your life. You know, look at your clothing, look at your whatever. Um, you know, I use clothing, furniture, things like that. Do you tend to, you know, do like more yard sailing and do uh, thrift shopping and stuff like that and tend to go for like a good variety of really inexpensive stuff? Do you kind of like the thrill of the deal and stuff like that? And that's what you want and you kind of just amass more quantities of it so you have lots of options. If that's what you tend to do in more other areas of your life, I would definitely urge you to do that with fountain pens too. If you're more like, nope, I'm a minimalist, I want to have a couple of really nice things and then not worry about all the other stuff, then you probably would want to steer towards the higher end stuff and just have fewer of them. And honestly, you could kind of blend both and just have a few inexpensive pens too, <laughs> or a lot of expensive ones. That's kind of going off the extreme end, but um, I would say just, you know, it's going to be more reflective of kind of who you are generally and what your personality style is. I would say that most people who collect or get into, you know, get further into the pen hobby, it's not just a passive thing, but you really kind of are into it for a number of years and you end up kind of amassing a collection. People that I know that um, kind of are more of the minimalists, they may acquire a lot of pens, but then they'll sell them off and then just narrow it down to kind of those few that after they've used them for a while, they're like, yeah, you know what? I really only want three pens. I bought maybe 50 and sold off most of them so that I could find those three that really are the ones that I'm gonna use for the rest of my life. That, I respect that, I really do. And honestly, somebody like me, I am a pen hoarder. I'm an acquirer, I have a lot of pens. Granted, I use them for videos, I use them for reference. When I sit down on a video like this, I've got over a dozen pens right here that I can just pull out of my drawer and show you that's my situation, that's how I do it. So I'm a little different than most, but um, that, is, uh, that is more my style. It's reflective of who I am. I'm a teacher, you know, I wanna show you this stuff. I like to kind of collect things like this. I don't do this with many things in my life. I like woodworking tools, so I have a lot of woodworking tools. You know, things that I can use, I tend to collect a bunch. Other things, I tend to be a little bit more of a minimalist, though I do have a lot of Legos too, now that I think about it. Okay, I'm starting to see a pattern in my own life. Let me not fall down that rabbit hole of analyzing myself psychologically too much. That could be a dangerous space for me to visit, but... <laughs> um, in general, I would say there's kind of a law of diminishing returns with these fountain pens. Anything over $50, you could, you could kind of, you know, you have to kind of justify sometimes <laughs> as to why, you know, you can get into gold nib pens and that's where, you know, get in the $150 to $200 range. You can pretty well justify that jump. Going beyond that, you're pretty much like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it because I want it. <laughs> that's, that's about it. Uh, and I, I just, you know, there's some, you don't really need more of an explanation than that sometimes. Um, but uh, I would say there's definitely a different feeling you get to when you get to some of these higher end pens. Things like, you know, Visconti and Namiki and stuff like that, which I'll talk about in a later question. You get into some of these pens that there's more craftsmanship and things like, there's other elements to it um, that, that do, elicit a different feeling than some of these more mass produced pens like the Gin House and stuff like that. But if that's not really something that speaks to you, then it's not a value to you. So, you know, I've answered this kind of question a bunch of times before, but I would say in general, if I had not knowing your specific situation, I would say go with the lower end first. And if you find the higher end calling you, then you can move that way. But in general, I don't think most people are, let me get a few M1000s Maybe they would like to, but most people don't necessarily go that route. It's more, let me get a few Metropolitans and I'll kind of stick there. So hopefully any of that's helpful to you at all. All right, Cigar Nev on Instagram asked, how is the patina going on your Monograppa Mule? And what other pens do you have that age over time? Uh, it's looking good. It's looking good. I have never polished my personal one. So I'll zoom in a little bit and show you what I got going on. So this is the Monograppa Mule. It is a copper pen. Not a whole ton of copper pens out there. There's a few. There's some brass ones and stuff too, but here is a brand new Monograppa Mule. So you can see sort of the difference between the two. Um, trying to find the right angle. There you go. They're kind of shiny, so it's a little tough. There we go, a little bit. So it's definitely brighter. It's more of a um, shiny, there we go. That, that kind of shows it well. I'm getting a heavy patina on here. It's actually starting to turn a little bit green, which I am loving. 
And I don't know, I like the patinaed look, personally. It's just my style. I've intentionally, I haven't been um, using the pen regularly these last few weeks, but I've been intentionally pulling it out and like getting my hand oils on it and then putting it away. Not all the time, but maybe, you know, once or twice a week. I'll kind of pull it out and be like, oh yeah, let me check the patina and I'll feel it and I'll be like, oh, this looks good. Oh yeah, let me get it nice and nasty. And then I put it back and then just let it kind of keep patinaing. So I've had this now ever since we launched it, which was a couple of months ago. So it's been probably mm, maybe three months at the most that I've had this pen in my possession. So looking good, totally dig it. Love, I love that patina look, at least for copper. Um, I have some other pens that will patina as well. Now, maybe not patina so much, but I have the Pilot Sterling that I mentioned in the intro. Um, I also have another Sterling pen, a Yardo Lead. I don't, haven't really talked about them much. They used to be distributed by um, the same company that was uh, doing Lama USA. Um, so I started talks with them about Yardo Lead, and I was like, I don't know that I really have a market for Yardo Lead. Um, and honestly, I don't know that if I still do, but. Um, they are no longer the distributor anymore, so I'm actually not in contact with the Yardola distributor anymore. So if you are interested in one, I don't know, maybe I could chase them down, but nice pens, handmade in England and stuff like that, uh, all sterling silver, but also very expensive. So as you would expect with sterling. The Pilot ones are a little more affordable, but those pens will tarnish over time. They don't get quite as nice looking. Well, you can see here the difference, like the Pilot one is new. I just pulled this out of the box. And this one is um, tarnished a little bit, not too bad, but it's definitely cloudier looking. Uh, you can't really see it that far, boom. So definitely, it's like impossible. These things are like mirrors. But you can see it's cloudier looking. Granted, there's a barley pattern on it as opposed to a shiny one, but it's definitely hazier. That's what's gonna happen with silver. It's gonna get really kind of hazy and just not look great. You know, I like the patina that comes on copper a lot more than I do on silver. I also have a Keras Customs ink in brass, which hasn't patinaed a ton. The grip section has a little bit, but the brass just does not patina quite like the copper one does. Now Christian, my inventory manager here, he has been using his uh, Keras, Cost Kara Keras Customs Copper Fountain K, which is actually a really cool pen. Um, he's been using that regularly, but he polishes his up. So he just polishes it for a minute or two, like once a week, and it looks brand new. So I like the I like the patinaed look. He likes it shiny. To each his own. You can have it either way with these types of pens. So, um, and that is kind of what I. That's kind of what I have. There's also you know there's like a brass. Um, uh, what's it called? Kaweco, uh, Brass Sport. That one is gonna be the same situation as the Keras Customs here. It's gonna patina some, but not a ton, because brass just doesn't patina quite as much as copper does. Um, and then I don't have a whole ton of other ones. There's other like silver pens out there, not that many of them. Pen like the Watermark, the Visconti Watermark, that's gonna be in the same situation as the Pilot Sterling and the Yardle Lead here. But yeah. There's not a whole ton of other ones that patina a lot. I may be forgetting some, forgive me if I am. I'm like kicking myself last week for not remembering that the Twisby was a faceted pen. Sometimes I plan these Q and A's out, I'll even look through my website and try to remember stuff and I just miss some things. So I'm sorry, I'm just not like a savant when it comes to remembering stuff, but uh, I do my best. I do my best. All right, let's talk about some ink. Chew C on Facebook. I have a bottle of Diamond Golden Sands, which is a shimmer-tastic, that I tested in my cheapest pen, the Parker IM in medium, and it looked pretty at the beginning. However, the amount of shiny particles decreased as I kept writing, emptied the pen within five days and flushed it, only to see a concentrated pool of particles in my sink. What is causing the particles to stay in the feed and not flow out of the ink? So this is a particularly particulate ink, the Shimmertastic, same kind of thing with the uh, Jerbon Emerald of Chavor 1670, sorry, not Emerald of Chavor, 1670 uh, line, which Emerald of Chavor is one of them. Uh, these are pens that have, I'm sorry, inks that have uh, like a particulate in it. It's like a, kind of like a glitter. And uh, Certain pens like that, like your IM, I've never used my IM with Golden Sands or any of the shimmering inks, um, but I know that in general it's not like a gushing pen. You know, it's kind of middle of the road in terms of flow. So when you're dealing with um, a pen with its feed system and uh, an ink like this that has a particulate in it, 
it's going to la la. It's just going to take a little bit of trial and error in terms of how well that particulate's really going to flow through. Now I'm guessing because excuse me. I'm guessing that because you know, it started writing well and then it just didn't that great. You probably had a decent amount of particulate that was in there from filling the pen in the first place. And then once you use it a little bit, the initial stuff that came through the feed flowed out, which had a good particulate in it. And then everything else just kind of hung up in the converter. That could be the case. It also could be that, you know, not that much of it hung out. Um, the paper is a huge factor with this type of ink. So just in case, it's purely a factor of the paper and actually not the pen itself at all. Um, just know that absorbent paper is not going to um, show the particulate quite as much. I think because it's for two reasons. Number one is it's going to absorb into the paper and that is going to suck up a lot of the extra stuff that would normally be sitting on top of the page. Because what happens is you get this particulate and it pools up in these nice little wet areas on the paper and that's what shows that glittery stuff the most. But if it's absorbing into the paper, it's diffusing a lot of that and it doesn't really pool up, it kind of spreads out. I think, and this is a complete theory, have not validated, validated this by science in any way, but I think if you have absorbent paper, maybe, just maybe, you might be seeing that the particulate that's in the ink is not flowing as fluidly and as fast as the liquid dye that's in the ink itself. And it may be that the more absorbent the paper, it's drawing through that actual liquid ink faster, but the particulate's not kind of coming along with it. So it's gathering up in your pen. Maybe? Does that sound like a theory? I don't know. That's a theory. It is not proven by science, but it would make sense in my head that that would be the case. Maybe you can give me your thoughts too. But I think that maybe is some of what you're going on, what's going on. Last thing I want to leave you with there is that um, if you are um, doing regular cleaning and maintenance with it, that's going to help, especially if you're using this kind of particulate ink in there. And I think, you know, you're seeing some of that particulate like in your sink and stuff when you're cleaning it out. That's also kind of just normal. Even if it wasn't like built up in your pen a lot, Anytime you're just cleaning out this type of ink, you're gonna see some of that particulate pulling up. I don't know, I'm having to go purely off of what you're saying and not what I'm actually seeing in that case. I'm just trying to give you some hy hypotheses as to what could be going on. So hopefully any of that's helpful to you. This question is from Kathy on our blog. Kathy, I know you like to comment a lot, so I'm happy to be answering your question this week. Kathy asks, I love, all caps, the letter of the, uh, the, <laughs> the letter, hmm made that word up. I love the color of the walls in your new office. What ink do you think is closest to your wall color? I'm buying it. Okay. Well, my walls are not for sale. Sorry, Kathy. Oh, you mean the ink. Oh, the ink that matches the walls. Okay. That makes more sense. Uh, I don't know that I actually have an exact match because honestly, this color is pretty unique. And uh, I'm, a I'm, I'm a little bit, a little bit ashamed that I did not take the time to paint my walls Goulet Blue. For those of you who've been loyal Q&A watchers, you now know that this is the third location I've been shooting Goulet q and I've been moving a bit within my own office. And uh, when I moved here about six weeks ago, a month ago, yeah, six weeks ago. No, not quite. A month ago, I don't know. I lose track of time sometimes because things move so fast. When I moved into this office, it was so nicely painted and I actually really like the color a lot. So I didn't paint it. I'm sorry. But anyway, you like this color. That's cool. I got a couple that I think will match it somewhat close. Maybe you could get samples and try them out. None of them are going to be dead on, but Diatramentis Document Green, I feel like is fairly close. Granted, this isn't like a, a heavy green color. It's really a blue green with some gray in it. It's a really interesting color and also depends a lot on the lighting in here too. But I think that Document Green, has a, like a green with that grayish kind of tone. Diamine Umber, it's a little darker, but it might be something worth considering. It's also not permanent, so if you don't want the permanence of the document green, you can try Diamine Umber. And then Noodler's Polar Green, again, we're going back to the permanent colors, Polar Green. So Document Green and Polar Green are both pretty absorbent and kind of feather and uh, just, you know, all around are, you know, they have the permanent qualities, which is really nice. Not that common in greens, but, if you don't really want that, umber would be would be your choice. And I think that's going to be kind of the closest match to what I have going on here. I looked at a lot of others and there just wasn't anything 
exactly right. But there you go, Kathy. Got some business questions this week, some good ones. Oh, uh, this, yeah, this good one. All right, Jamie M on Facebook, hit me right in the gut on this question. I feel like Goulet has been getting in a lot of $100 and up new pens and not much in the more affordable range below that. We had the new Safari and I think a couple of others from brands that Goulet already carried, but it just seems like so few, especially next to the new brands you've been carrying like Visconti and Namiki that are super high end. What gives? Is there a reason Goulet seems to be reaching more and more for expensive pens? Jamie? Thank you for just being straight up, calling me out, and just asking me these questions. You're actually not the only one. A lot of people have been asking this. We've been sending out newsletters that have just been, happened to be featuring a lot more high-end pens, and people are like, what gives? I can't afford a $1,000 pen. Why do you keep showing me these pens I can't have? And people get mad. Other people are like, these pens are gorgeous. I love seeing them, even though I can't afford them. Other people are like, I want to buy it. So it's all over the place. But yes, I do agree, and I fully recognize how high-end heavy our product offering, our new product offering has been lately. A lot of that is because we've never offered these like really high-end pens before. For the last six and a half years, we've been offering, you know, all the really affordable stuff. We've never had the really high-end stuff. So this is a new foray for us. So being that it's a new foray, whenever we're launching a new line of pens, it's gonna get a lot of coverage. You know, it happened last year, we carried Cross. Cross had, you know, a somewhat decent range. Well, actually their stuff was not that inexpensive either, but had a range of pricing. And we, you know, we're talking about Cross a lot last year. We definitely got feedback where people were like, I don't care about Cross, stop showing me Cross. But it's just, it's how it happens whenever we carry a new line, you know, especially something as extensive as Namiki or something like Visconti where they just keep coming out with new stuff all the time. Like Visconti comes out with way more new stuff than anybody else. It just this is how they've been doing it. So part of it is like, yeah, they come out with new stuff that's in small batches and then it's gone after a couple of months. That's how they do. So some of that is gonna be, you know what, it's just how they roll. And that's that's it, as part of, you know, representing them, that's how it's gonna be. Now we are trying to mix in as much non like super expensive exclusive stuff as we can. But I will say like in the springtime, like there's a lot of stuff that comes out in the holidays but in the springtime, like everybody kind of goes into retraction mode a little bit. And then we do get some more pens that come out, like the Lamis, you know, that we usually come out with a special edition, like the Dark Lilac, which was great. You know, there's some other stuff that usually comes out. A lot of things that were going to come out in the spring have actually been pushed back a little bit. You know, like the Pilot Kakuno was supposed to be coming out in the spring. That got pushed back until later in the year. You know, other things like that, that just, uh, and then there's other things that honestly, it's, it's, it's not new, whole new lines. It's just an additional new color. So it just doesn't get as much fanfare as a whole new line would. So a lot of it is just our own promotional uh, muster that we put behind something. When it's a new line, a new model, you know, there's more to talk about. People are less familiar with it. So there's more to share. If it's like, you know, a dark lilac, it's like, oh, it's a purple pen. Ah, oh, you know, but everybody, for the most part, knows what a safari is. So it's not gonna get quite the same degree of oomph as a new line would. So that's part of it. And so literally my, my explanation is we have strategically carried these high-end brands. It happens to be that they've come at the, around the same time. It happens to be that they're getting a lot of fanfare just because that's how it worked out. It's not like we're going this way and we're never going back. It's really not like that at all. Um, with a lot of the lower end stuff or the more affordable stuff, whatever, I hate to call things low end, but the more affordable products, you know, the Pilot Metropolitans, Gin House, things like that. There's a lot of churn with these types of products and especially like brands and lines because you have to make such an investment with the low, lower end stuff. I keep saying lower end with the, the, I'll call it like the more mass produced stuff. So things like Visconti and Namiki and all that are not mass produced by any means. This kind of stuff is mass produced. You know, they make it in large quantities, minimal handwork involved, they keep the low price down and they sell it in huge volume. So when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, they're not gonna come out with quite as many models just because you might have to sell five million pens 
to pay back all the initial research and development and equipment and promotion and all this other kind of stuff worldwide. So that's a ton of pens. And they just may not come out with that many. So what they're going to do is they're going to take the existing models they have and just come out with new colors. That's a lot of times what happens in the lower end pens. Again, I keep saying lower end. The affordable pens, excuse me. And then when you get into the, the expensive stuff, it's a lot more handwork one way or the other. So whether they're making one you know, exclusive high-end pen or another, they can change the design, they can change the models and stuff like that and do it more frequently because they have the price to absorb some of that. They have you know, more individual craftsmen and stuff that are working on it that are gonna be spending the same amount of time on an older pen versus a newer pen. So they're gonna change things up maybe a little more often. So there's just gonna be some of that aspect of like new things in the high-end stuff a little bit more because they're going to be you know having exclusives and some of that kind of stuff um, yeah and that's just the best of my explanation right now um, it's not that I have a bias towards them or not it just happens to be that that's how things have lined up at least for these last couple of months you know Namiki was something that we had been approached about a year ago and then we went and saw them in person when we went to visit Jacksonville uh, Pilot USA last November, and then it's literally been in the works since last November for us to carry the Namiki line. So it's been super long-term, like, you know, plan to carry this brand. We've been approached by other higher-end brands that we haven't pursued and may not pursue. You know, I mentioned Yardalud earlier. That was one that we were approached a couple of years ago about doing and it was like yeah I just don't think that that's for us and uh, and we never pursued it you know other ones like Graf von Faber-Castell we've talked to them we've talked to um, Karen Dosh you know we've talked to some of these other you know Pelican obviously as uh, we were a Pelican retailer you know well we're, we're Faber-Castell and, and other ones too and we just haven't we just haven't pulled the trigger on these yet because we're not trying to force it you know what I mean we try to gauge interests we try to you know, go off of where the demand is. There's definitely demand for Visconti. Namiki's a little more roll of the dice, um, but you know, we've been pretty pleased with its reception so far. So I don't want you to think that I'm like getting away from like who we really are and all this kind of stuff. Uh, for me, it's just like I've been able to learn and grow and appreciate these high-end pens more. I also really appreciate the full range of pens, as I've said many times in Q&A before. So um, I just, I view it as they're all, beautiful and I love all of these pens and I'm really happy to be able to offer a full range of them. Now I am sorry that it's come on a little heavy on the high-end side of things so bear with me it's not always going to be the case there we're going to try to have a good mix and that is something too like as our newsletter subscription grows and stuff like that we're thinking about like do we need to start like splitting it out and like you know, segmenting like high-end versus you know affordable stuff and all these kinds of these are all conversations that like we're trying to have because we don't want to continually be like pounding people one way or the other with things that they're not interested in so i'm very open to this kind of feedback uh and i'm receptive to it and i completely you know hear you and i'm not trying to force it down your throat but um, you know, that's how it's been. It's going to lighten up and then we're going to get into other things. We have like, you know, we have other things like Goulet notebooks that are, you know, a few dollars and, you know, we're going to have other pens like the Pilot Kakuno is going to be a big deal and that's going to be more in like September, but, um, you know, other things like that, that I'm really excited about that are, that are on, on the affordable side. And I'll continue kind of searching those out. They're just, there's just not as many of those uh, available because we carry a lot of the, a lot of the good brands that fit us well. Cool. I hope that helps. Hope that helps you out there. All right, at 5Goofy24 on Twitter, how does bringing Machia into your inventory change or enhance your business model? It seems like an interesting venture. <laughs> Somebody's like really intrigued by Namiki. Somebody else is like, stop showing me all this stuff. Ah, oh, it's just kind of funny. Um, so yes, Namiki uh, Machia into inventory. So for me, I think a lot of it calls back to, um, you know, just my, my craftsman days. Because for those of you who are aware, the Goulet Pen Company originally started out with my handmade wooden pens. And uh, I really appreciate the artistry and craftsmanship that goes into Machier. I mean, they study for decades to be able to have the skill required to make those pens. And that's just really, really interesting to me. Uh, it's not for everybody, it's super, super niche. I totally get that. It's very much in like collector grade territory. And I understand that. Um, that 
that is a new foray for us. Yes, like Machie in terms of its technique is relatively new for us. We have carried the vanishing point in the uh, Machie Rodden, uh, which is the abalone uh, shell, abalone shell that's like sprinkled on the pen. Uh, so we've had that, the, the Vanishing Point Galaxy, for several years. Uh, that technically is, is Yurushi Makie, just like the higher end uh, Namiki uh, Makie pens. The other Namiki pens are, are completely new for us. We have not special ordered them to any great degree before. Uh, I think the first special order we had for one of those was mm, a couple of months ago. So it's not like anything that we dabbled in years ago. It's, it's really a new thing for us. In fact, the only Makie pens we've ever sold before were platinum Machier pens, which are also quite nice. And in fact, I think we're gonna be having one of those uh, coming out soon too. So that's kind of exciting, it's a pretty cool pen. But anyway, so it's a new thing. I appreciate the craftsmanship, the artistry, the design that goes into it. It's really a different animal. It's more art than it is uh, just like a functional pen. They're obviously very functional pens, but that's not the main selling point of the pen, uh, clearly because you can get much less expensive pens without all the stuff on it. So um, it's been interesting for me. It's, it's a new type of customer who's really interested in these kind of collector grade things. It's um, definitely not like a primary focus uh, for me. I think that um, the collector territory, it's, it's a different thing. It's a, it's a type of customer that we're looking to serve and serve well based on you know, kind of who we are and a lot of things. I also think the, the landscape of pen collecting is changing. I don't think it's quite the same as it used to be, which I think is part of why some of the like collector status companies like Visconti, Namiki, and stuff like that are interested in what we do is because being online only and kind of the approach we have with the personal engagement and stuff like this is, uh, is a little different approach than maybe kind of the brick and mortar store in a high-end metropolitan area uh, that sells to lawyers and bankers and doctors and stuff like that, you know, a lot of those uh, customers that have been collecting these high-end Mont Blancs and things like that for years, um, you know, they'll buy a pen and they'll stick it in a safety deposit box or in a safe or under their bed or whatever, and or then maybe they'll display it and it'll just be a, a work of art, but they're not actually writing with them very often. I don't think that's usually how they work. Um, the vast majority of our customers who are buying these same, like, quality of pens are actually writing with them and using them, which I think is awesome because I do the same thing. You know, I, I use my Homo sapiens all the time. And this is, you know, an expensive pen. A lot of these other pens, like, I care about how they write. I want them to look amazing, but I also really care about how they write because they're pens, you know. I think that's important. So it's functional art. So that's really kind of cool to be able to have that kind of influence on the industry side to be able to influence our customers, educate and do a lot of the great things that we have been doing all along. And for us, it's just been kind of, kind of continuation because when I started out, um, for the first year of Goulet pens, we actually didn't sell any pens at all. I had kind of gotten out of making my own pens. We sold ink and paper. I wanted to focus purely on that. And it was very humbling for me to admit that I didn't know that much about the fountain pen world. So I learned ink and paper as well as I could at the time, and then started getting into pens with the Platinum Preppy, the original Noodler's Nib Creeper before the Flex Pen was out, you know, and these very, very humble pens. Then I started to get into the Lamy Safari and the Pelican Script and Pelicano and, you know, these $20 pens and stuff like that. Um, over time, started to get into gold nib pens, and now I'm, I'm after six and a half years, getting into these kind of collector grade pens. When at the time, I had kind of this vision of at the time when I started the company, it was like, okay, clearly most other retailers are focusing on really fancy pens. No one is really focusing on ink and paper. So that's how I'm gonna distinguish myself. I'm gonna prove myself in the community by learning stuff and doing essentially the grunt work, you know, learning the things that most other people are not willing to take the time to learn. And through that, proving myself, doing the videos, earning the reputation, I'm gonna gain that trust and gain that experience and reputation so that when I do eventually get to these very exquisite products, it won't be unnatural on who's this young guy that's trying to be a hot shot with these pens. Maybe that's how you feel about me, I don't know. Hopefully not, but <laughs> I've tried to like very legitimately build a foundation for myself as I've learned to appreciate higher and higher end pens. And I can really appreciate all full range of pens now. So I'm just trying to, you know, uh, represent that as well as I can. 
and I don't think it's really going to change my business model to get back to your original question here. I think it's going to, um, you know, just be another another thing uh, that I can appreciate a little bit deeper that, uh, you know, our customer base here can appreciate a little deeper. And uh, it's just kind of a, a fuller range of offerings than we've had before as far as the pens go. So that to me is what interests me. It's not like, okay, we're going to become like all high end or anything like that. That's not really my interest. My heart still lies in the intro level products because I want to get people into fountain pens. But I also want to be there. I realize it's a very tight knit community and it's a very close uh, community that uh, feels very well served by what we do here at Goulet. And I want to continue to serve those customers who also want the higher end stuff, but also buy you know, the the more affordable stuff. So being able to kind of offer that full range um, for the people who are really in the fountain pen world. There. All right, this is from 77OC on Instagram. Now that GP has numerous employees and is busier than ever, talk about finding the balance of being the manager of people and the challenge of staying on top of the products you sell. Do you find that you have to compromise one for the other? Oh, this is a great question because compromise, you know, compromise, uh, it's, it's sort of like that. Okay, so compromise in its definition means um, you're not really doing one whole thing or the other. You're doing a blend of the two and kind of like splitting the difference. So I don't know if I want to get too nitty gritty on, on <laughs> reading into that, that question of compromising one or the other. I would say um, it has been more difficult for me now than ever to balance this out, by far. In the earlier days, it was all about products, all about products, and anything that was related to training my team was training them about products and about how to serve customers and about how to learn how to use fountain pens and all that. Um, that was my sole focus. I realized about three years into this business, after we had about a dozen people working here, that if I didn't focus on um, you know, people development and communication and leadership and enhancing myself in that way, then the product knowledge wouldn't really matter as much because I would be spending all my time firefighting communication issues and people drama. Uh, because of my own mismanagement, that uh, that product knowledge, I wouldn't have time for it anyway. So it has very much been a balance for me all along the way, but especially in the last three and a half to four years since I came to that realization that the leadership side of things was something I really needed to focus on. Now, when I was in high school, I received the leadership medallion. I still, to this day, don't know which teacher uh, nominated me for that medallion, but out of what of 450 in my graduating class or so, no, it wasn't quite that many. That was Rachel's class. My class is like 360 or something like that, 370. Um, but I got the leadership medallion. I still don't know why. I was the XO of my junior ROTC. I was a dance captain and show choir. Yes, that's true. I was in you know first chair contrabass clarinet player. My grades were okay, but. <laughs> I, I like the extracurriculars a lot more in school. Um, you know, I was in like beta club and French club and all these other various things. So I was very active in school. I did the track team, you name it. Um, uh, I went to the Corps of Cadets for Virginia Tech, ate up all the leadership I possibly could, um, studied for a minor in leadership, which I never actually got because I left the Corps halfway through my junior year, which is something I don't talk about quite as much as being in the Corps in the first place, but that was the right decision for me at the time. Anyway. That's a whole other situation I won't get into right now, but um, for me, it has been a big, big challenge to do both. Um, because I think I'm in kind of a unique situation because I network with a lot of other business owners and have consultants that work with a lot of other business owners who help me with you know, finances and HR and business strategy and stuff like that. Um, I'm in a pretty unique situation, I think, in terms of um, spending as much time doing this kind of stuff, uh, being this direct, in contact with you guys, um, this knowledgeable about the products and being this kind of a, this subject matter expert who's also running a company. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, 
up there with several of his books, um, has very much kind of led the path for me in that way to show me that, yes, it can be done that way. It's just really hard and <laughs> takes a ton of time and effort. Um, and definitely on some days, I feel like I'm halfway doing two things uh, and not doing either of them well. Um, so jack of all trades and master of none sorts of thing. Uh, I definitely feel like that sometimes. I really do. And that's tough. But, you know, honestly, sometimes you're just going to feel that way anyway. Not even talk about the whole aspect of like the fact that I have two kids and I have a wife who I'm trying to be a good husband to and I have my personal health and I have to worry about my sleep and stress and working out and I'm a little heavier than I'd like to be right now because I I'm a little out of balance in my personal health and you know you just you can't have it all you have to balance things out and this is the case for anybody and uh, more so than ever I've been reading a book uh, called essentialism which I actually have in my backpack right here it's by Greg McEwen it's a really really good book I like it a lot um, it's called the discipline disciplined pursuit of less um, so it's a really good book I highly recommend it that you check it out. I've read through it many, many times and I have to keep reading it and I will keep reading it until it really sinks in. Um, but it's basically uh, built upon a principle that David Allen, who I'm a big fan of as well, um, the guy who's behind getting things done, uh, the principle of you can do anything but you can't do everything. So it's all about trade-offs and it's about focusing on the most important things. That has become more and more important for me as my kids are getting older and my time is just not infinite, just like yours is not infinite. We all have the same 24 hours in a day and we can choose to spend our time doing things that we feel other people want us to do or that we don't really decide to do but it just kind of happens or we can focus on the things that we really feel make the greatest contribution to this world and to our purpose in life and then intentionally focus all our time and efforts around those things. But you can't do that without making some very real trade-offs. So for me, a lot of that has come from, yes, I wanna learn the products. I, I have a huge basis of knowledge when it comes to products now that I didn't have in the early days. So the amount of time that I need to spend learning products now is not as great as it, had, as it was even three or four years ago because I have a really solid foundation. So now more of my time is actually spent on the leadership and personal development side of things uh, and developing other leaders in our company. We have 38 people here right now uh, and we're still growing. I know for a fact we're gonna be hiring more uh, later in this year. Um, that's part of the, all the strategy stuff I was talking about earlier. Um, that's a lot of how that's gonna work. So um, we're gonna continue to be growing and a lot of that is because we have a really good team that I've been able to train and develop and they've really been able to grow a lot and continue kind of that, you know, in our, our oldest team member, uh, most tenured team member, Drew, he's our customer care manager. Um, I've known him since third grade. He's been here for five years now. Uh, and he was the third person, you know, it, it was me and Rachel. You know, he was our, um, there was actually one other uh, guy, Ben, who's a solid guy. If he happens to be watching this, love you, Ben. Congrats on your wedding. Um, you know, Ben has is, uh, since moved on and, and to other areas of his life, but Drew is our oldest current tenured um, uh, team member. And so it was us three, and then we have, you know, 38 of us total. So in the last five years, we've essentially hired and kept the 35 other people here. Yeah, obviously we've had some others who very honorably have come and served and moved on to other areas of their life. So it's been more than than just 36 other people that we've uh, had the, the honor of getting to know over the last five years. But that's a pretty uh, short time frame to be hiring and training up that many people. And there's no way, no way I'd be able to do that successfully unless I just got really lucky, which sometimes I have, sometimes I have not. Uh, really lucky hiring great people. Um, some, but a lot of it has just been super, super intentional and about spending time developing other people who can uh, do the things that hopefully better than me um, in terms of, you know, customer service and packing orders and, you know, photography and video and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Goodness knows on the media side of things, how much my team has helped over the years um, from what it was when I was doing everything. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's trade-off. So for me, 
um, the things that I have to kind of ask and related to this like whole essentialism concept, and I kind of bulleted out three little thoughts here. Um, when it comes at, when it comes to you know kind of finding what is essential to you, you have to ask yourself: number one, is this something worth doing at all? And you have to be kind of ruthless about that because it's like if you don't even if you should if you don't even if you don't even need to be doing it, then it doesn't matter how effectively or whether you train it or way or whatever. Just get rid of it. Just cut it out altogether. For me, part of that is my social life. I've never really been that social to begin with, um, but I have two young kids, and aside from doing what I need to to kind of be social with my kids, I really don't have much of a social life. Now, my wife and I are in the church choir. That's like our one social thing, but that's also, you know, not, that that's our one social thing. Um, but other than that, we don't really have a friend network. We don't get together with people on a regular basis. It's pretty much like family members and people from work. Um, that's just a thing. I don't, I, I'm not involved in sports in any capacity. I have no time for sports or really much of any hobby outside of, you know, my hobby is like working on the business strategy, pens, cleaning my house, doing stuff with my kids. Like those are my hobbies. So like these are all essential things to me in my life. I don't, you know, go to, you know, uh, sporting events. I don't watch sports games. I keep going back to sports because a lot of, you know, guys especially that I know are, are really into sports. I don't really play video games. I watch a little bit of TV, but really not much. These are essential things I've had to, um, you know, pare down uh, to focus on uh, the, the essential things, and I've cut out, sorry, all the non-essential things, um, like that other stuff that I just mentioned. So number one is this something worth doing at all, and being really ruthless about this. Uh, number two is this something that only I can do, and if yes, do it. But if not, delegate it away. There are a lot of things that I really like to do, that I really want to do, but. It's not something that I'm the only one that can do it, or somebody else can maybe do it better than me, and that's that's, a, that's an ego thing, especially coming from starting the business and having done everything, uh, you know, bringing people on and training things away. Even literally now, like Jen is my new executive assistant, and um, there's a lot of things that I'm very capable of doing because I've not had an assistant up until three weeks ago, that I'm very intentionally having to be like, you know what, Jen. Please, please help me with this. I, you know, you're here for a reason. <laughs> I need to let this go. So it's it's literally being in my position, and Rachel has done the same thing. Just shedding, constantly shedding away, and training up, building up other people, training away things that maybe are even somewhat painful emotionally for me to give up, and then allowing them to just thrive and run with it and support them and cheer them on, and just shed that ego constantly. It's it's really a it's really a challenging process, especially to have done it this much over such a, a relatively short period of time. So, training up others, delegating away as much as possible, and then the last thing is focusing on my team because uh, they're what matters in terms of really making things work here. So, yes, I'm the Brian Goulet, whatever. I'm a guy. I'm just a guy. Um, I have spent a lot of time about pens, I've shot a lot of videos, so I have some experience in these things, but if you call the office here, I'm not gonna answer the phone. If you're emailing, I'm not gonna be answering the email. I do answer my direct email, though now Jen is helping me with that even a little bit because of my crazy schedule. Um, it's really my team. My team is shipping orders every day. My team is doing photography. My team is editing and helping with videos. You know, I'm, I'm the face in the videos and I help on the planning side of things, but I'm not editing, I'm not doing any of that kind of stuff. So it's really my team that does a lot of it. And the way that I'm gonna be most successful and this company is gonna be most successful is by me serving them. It's servant leadership, like all the way. That's really the heart of it. So um, yeah, I spend a lot of time serving my team. And that's, I spend a lot of my time reading stuff like this and trying to really get at the heart of what I, I can do best uh, to serve uh, in the best way possible. And a lot of that is just kind of shedding away, shedding away. Um, yeah, and that's kind of where I'll leave that one off. Uh, last question I have this week, this is a personal question. I'll leave on a little bit lighter note because that question got kind of heavy there. Uh, last question for this week is from Natalia Chataz on Instagram. <laughs> Love some of these handles. Uh, what is one of the worst pens you've ever had? Um, this is good and kind of fun. I thought of three. 
Um, I've never really had any pens that I've truly like been ashamed of and just like really regretted. Honestly, like some of the pens have been at like cheaper and maybe broken or something like that. I really haven't had a lot of pens break though. Um, have been ones that uh, I've always learned something from, so I still even appreciate those. But some of the more comical ones that I have, um, there's a brand called Tachia, which we used to retail back in the day. It's been about five years since we've carried Tachia. Um, but this pen, it's actually not a terrible looking pen, um, but it's its somewhat comical. Um, so Tatcha, at the time they were transitioning, uh, Atoya was their distributor, they were transitioning their nibs. So we would get shipments with, sometimes they would have logoed nibs and sometimes they would just say Iridium Point Germany. Sometimes they'd be two-tone, sometimes they'd be regular. It was quite inconsistent and a little bit frustrating for those of us who are like, you know, uh, you can imagine. Imagine if we shipped you a pen and you didn't know that it was going to be two-tone or regular. Just wouldn't be having it, right? Um, that's what we were getting. So that was a little frustrating to work through. I don't know if they've since worked through that. It's been five years. Maybe we just caught them at a bad time. Um, but uh, this pen is called the Doric, D-O-R-I-C. But of course, we affectionately call it the Dork. And uh, it had a jewel in the clip that has since fallen off. It had, of course, the random nib thing. It has this grip, which is actually not too bad. It kind of looks nice, but it's not super functional. It's, it's, uh, it's not like faceted, but it's kind of textured in just this very interesting in way. Um, it's like this kind of barley pattern of sorts. So it's, I actually think it looks okay. It's just kind of weird for a grip. Um, and then it's got a huge step on it, which is, uh, you know, just the cap is really enormous on this thing too. Uh, and then in the top, it has this little inlaid finial that has this kind of scripty letter G. Don't know why. I was like, cool, Goulet. Uh, <laughs> but it's called the Tachia Doric, but it has a G in the top. Never could figure out why. So, um, and then the real kicker of this particular pen was um, it was not like drilled out consistently. So it would fit a converter on some of the pens, but not other ones. So I guess it like wasn't bored out. It was like just quite at the depth where if you weren't drilling all the way, it wouldn't fit a converter. So really just a lot of things against this pen. So we have this one lone pen left. Um, and then uh, another pen that I have is called the Platignum Studio. This is actually not a terrible pen. Uh, I actually kind of liked it. This is why we carried it in the first place. Um, but part of the reason why I, I didn't like it as much is because we were carrying Platinum and then we picked up Platignum and then we were carrying Monteverde with the Invincia and uh, no, this was, no, sorry, not the uh, Monteverde. Okay, so it kind of looks like a Monteverde Invincia uh, a little bit, but it was called Platignum, which was similar to Platinum, and it's called the Studio, which of course you have the Lamy Studio. So just trying to communicate to people what this pen even was, was just about impossible. Um, and it was like a $30 pen, it wasn't terrible, but it used its own proprietary cartridge. No other cartridge would fit on it, did not come available with a converter, and it only had two colors, black and blue. So it was okay. You know, we were like, well, we'll try it. Uh, and it just did not work for us. You know, it's a British brand. The quality of the pen's actually fairly decent, other than the fact that you can't really use anything but their two ink colors. So it just ultimately flopped and we discontinued it. The other thing which I don't have to show you um, was a brand called Online Pens from Germany. Um, the quality was okay, um, but it was called Online Pens. Like, I, I would like for you right now to go do a search for Online Pens and tell me what you find. So the brand awareness around this company was not great. Um, their, their, um, their products were more along the lines of like, Acme and Think Pens and Retro 51, just a lot of these like kind of wild designs. And we were just kind of in the phase of like acquiring whatever brands we could. This was back in our garage, you know, six years ago, five, six years ago. Um, and online just was not a big hit for us. So we discontinued it. Uh, I regretfully did not even keep a single online pen, um, but they had some pretty interesting ones in terms of design and stuff like that. But yeah, trying to communicate to, to customers about what online pens were uh, was pretty interesting. 
So uh, that'll do it for this week. Hope you enjoyed this Q and A. Hope you enjoyed my shirt. I just think it's interesting to wear to wear fun shirts on the Q and A's. Um, my question of the week for this week. I'm just going to just straight roll off the last question that we had and ask you what is the worst pen that you have ever had. And now you could just say a ballpoint, but I'm. Uh, but you know. Maybe that is your story. So I'm just going to be curious, especially if you have any really funny stories about pens that have like, you know, broken or fallen apart or exploded or something like that. I haven't had anything that dramatic. Honestly, I haven't been that, you know, I wish I had something more interesting. I think the, the dork is kind of funny. And honestly, you know, I, I should have a disclaimer here too. I have nothing against Tachia or, or Platignum or online. I think they're fine companies. Um, just the product, you know, wasn't quite well suited for us. Uh, I don't want to have any like make it seem like I have any like bad feelings or anything like that. But anyway, so that's question of the week. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, you totally should because it's the place to be. Um, be sure to follow me on all my channels. I'm on Snapchat, Brian Goulet, Instagram. You can follow us, Goulet Pens on Instagram, yada, yada, yada. Lots of places, lots of things. Um, I hope you have a great weekend and a great rest of the week and right on.